everyone I've encountered that has clutter is overwhelmed right off the bat. That's the first thing. Like I, you might be frozen and you can't take a step. You're like, where do I begin? Clutter is anything that prevents you from creating the life you choose, deserve, and desire. It encompasses everything. You can have emotional clutter, spiritual clutter, clutter in your relationships, health. It's, it's everything. It's what isn't important that you're allowing to impede your life. Hey, welcome to another episode of the Coffee Break Podcast. Our mission here is to share business ideas, practices, and strategies while we enjoy our cup of coffee. Today's guest is Julie Caraccio, and she is going to be talking a little bit about declutter. Now, we're going to talk a lot about your personal life, uh, decluttering your desk, decluttering your car, or decluttering your house. But we're also going to be talking about it in applications of the business world. And I think this is something that we probably overlook at times. That's going to be a big topic of conversation for today. But before we jump into that, I do want to invite you and remind you and ask you, suggest maybe, yeah, to subscribe if you haven't already. Wherever you're listening to this episode, if it's on uh, a audio podcast platform, hit the subscribe button so you'll get the latest episodes every week. If you would like to see the video version of this as well, you can do that by finding us on YouTube and Facebook. That is available by searching LOC DOC. You can find links to everything in all of the places that we are at by visiting us at lockdoc.net slash podcast. Thank you very much for joining us today. Let's get into this conversation with Julie. We got so much to say. We got a podcast to make. We're sipping on lattes. And it's time for a coffee break. It's time for a coffee break. Oh, yeah. Julie, welcome to the podcast today. Thank you for being here. Are you a coffee drinker? I am occasionally, and it's got to be flavored and have some sugar, but I'm on keto, so it's got to be the non-sugary sugar. Oh, well, I apologize, but I'm going to drink uh, coffee while we're having our conversation today. It's a fresh brew, and it's really, really hot. But anyways, thank you for being here. We're going to jump into rapid fire, five randomly selected questions just to get under your skin with unknown point values, and then we'll <laughs> give you a score at the end. Are you ready? I'm ready. Question number one, what's something that you think that you may have been the only person in the world to ever do? Oh, wow. That's a really great question. I can answer for the state of North Carolina, but in the world, what is the only thing, um, oh my gosh, that I've ever done. Uh, I'm the only person, I, you know what, I can't, can't think worldwide. Can I give you something for the state of North Carolina? Let's, let's do the state of North Carolina. That sounds I was the first person to uh, specialize in green and eco-organizing. Oh, interesting. Green. green Not green. worldwide, but. In North Carolina. Correct. But, you know, I know that for a fact. Organizing. Well, we'll have to figure out what in the world that means uh, here shortly. Okay. So, uh, second question. Number two, if you were going to start your own business, what would it be? Well, I have my own business now, so let's do, if I was going to start an, oh, I'll tell you what I would do. I would start another business making flower essences, and that's a potential, for real, for real, as the kids say. Okay, flower essences. I'm uh, just taking notes here of all of the things that you're saying that I have no idea what you're talking about. What is a flower essence? So everything's energy. And I would also do it for trees, too. So you take the flower, you put it out overnight, hopefully in moon sign, maybe sunshine, depending. All flowers have different properties. And so you get the water, and then that creates an essence. So then you have the energy of that flower. So say if you were sad, there are different flowers out there that have properties. So you would use the flower essence to help lift your spirit. Ah, I do that with coffee beans. I put coffee and go. water and set it out overnight and drink it. It gives me energy. There you go. There are different folks, different strokes, different folks, <laughs> all that. Great answer. Question number three, what's your close call story? Uh, at marriage, I had a close call, almost happened twice, luckily didn't, and I met the most wonderful man ever. So third time's a charm. All right. Nice story. Number question number four, what's something that you find attractive that others may not? Oh, that others may not. I'm into, uh, past lives. Okay. And believing that I've been around before. Really? Correct. Mundo. Yes. All right. Question number five, what is the most spontaneous thing that you've ever done? 
Uh, uh, that's really funny. Uh, that would be moved to Los Angeles without knowing a soul. And oh, really? Thought I, yep. And they, my family thought I lost my mind because I was kind of a hippie. I was living in Vermont and Massachusetts. And they're like, you know, we could see Seattle. We could see Portland, L.A. We don't get it. Oh, wow. That's crazy. All right. Well, congratulations. You passed rapid fire. Uh, we're going to give you a score of 637. <laughs> I'll take it. All righty. Well, thank you for uh, for being here today. So we're going to be talking a little bit. And I mean, on your screen, I think it says it all. Clutter does not have to own you. So I'm going to talk a little bit about, uh, I guess, clutter, about uh, reorganizing your life uh, and maybe reorganizing your life as it pertains to the things that you acquire. I, I, I uh, heard a gentleman say one time uh, that he heard somebody else say it, so I don't know who to attribute it to, but if you look at your desk, your car, and your closet and the state of those three things, it will give you a uh, representation of the kind of state of your life. So if it's a mess, then your life is probably a mess as well. So I go, that's going to be my question number one. Do you agree with that statement or uh, do you have a different perspective on it? Oh, you know what? I like that statement. I'd never heard that before. And I think that's really interesting. And what I believe is the inside is reflected on the outside and vice versa. So if your desk is a hot mess, you probably have a lot of mental clutter going on as well. And one thing that's important to me is that people see the bigger picture of clutter. And what I mean by that, if your desk is messy, you can be like, oh, it's just clutter. No, it's probably a roadblock to you getting a promotion or a roadblock to a client hiring you because they, even if we're not aware of it, we're thinking, oh, can I trust this person? Are they going to lose my documents? Are they going to pay attention to me because they're not keeping their desks neat? Does that make sense? It, it absolutely makes sense. I like that statement, clutter is a roadblock dot, dot, dot. You can kind of fill that yes. into whatever it is that you want to put it in. But typically speaking, it's a representation of what else you've got going on, kind of, mm -hmm. I think you said, in your mind. You know, and you can't hold two opposing thoughts at once. So you can't have anxiety and worry and be at peace. So it's very important to be aware. What are my thoughts? What am I thinking? Interesting. Can't hold two opposing thoughts at once. I, can you Can you dive into that a little more? Sure. So say you're jealous of your neighbor. So, you know, there's this whole keeping up with the Joneses. And that's one of the reasons that people tend to acquire stuff. All my kids it has to have is not enough or more than the next door neighbor in class. So if you're jealous of someone, then you're going to want to buy, buy, buy. But if you are in gratitude, then you aren't going to want to buy. I can't be in gratitude and be in jealous at the same time. Does that help clarify? Absolutely. I, I like that. It's a great example. So if I'm in that mode, and so I've found myself in this situation where clutter is kind of controlling everything that's going on right now, and I just, I'm struggling. I feel like I'm always kind of, um, kind of chasing my tail because one, I can't find things or, mm -hmm. um, or the clutter is just overwhelming. And then I get like, just don't want to deal with it. And it just kind of gets pushed off. How do I, one, I guess, how do I recognize it first? Because uh, is, is that something that people automatically see or is it something that has to be pointed out to them? It really depends on the person. But I would say everyone I've encountered that has clutter is overwhelmed right off the bat. That's the first thing. Like I, you might be frozen and you can't take a step. You're like, where do I begin? Because I'm so overwhelmed. I can't even think now there are other people who can look around their space and say, yeah, I got a lot of stuff. I need to do something about it. And what's important to me is relating whatever the physical stuff is. What's it about? Like I mentioned a moment ago, keeping up with the Joneses or, you know, say people who have a lot of books, they have a fear. Some do that they're going to forget everything or lose information if they've gained, if they've given the book away. Now we know that that's not true. And so finding out what's the deeper meaning of your clutter and what's going on. And when you tackle that, then it's easier and just for the physical stuff to let it go. So I think that um, I'm trying to think through this from a business perspective as well, because uh, one, obviously, you know, say, let's look at our business uh, sure. specifically. We have a lot of employees. They each kind of have their own area of domain. And you see this play out in real life. Some folks mm -hmm. uh, have more cluttered areas. Some have more clean and organized areas. So the the question I'm going to ask you is, how do you start to process this by saying, okay, this is kind of standards or this is kind of the things that we want to work towards? Like we, so we can we can have that as an established target, but if we don't understand the reasoning why we mm -hmm. got to that point, I feel like we're just kind of always having to re 
remind, I guess. Um, so how do you how do you identify that at the at the heart of why you why why it that's comfortable for you? Right. Uh, that can be a variety of reasons. And, you know, whatever's going on at home is going to be reflected at work. So that's another challenge because you have to take into consideration that it, they might be struggling at home well, as well. And so if that's their habit, that's a big thing that you have to get through. You know, I would encourage simple things like clean up your desk at the end of the day or clean up your desk at the end of the week. You know, for people who there's this false belief, oh, I have to be in chaos to be creative. And so one of my favorite tips is, and you probably have this if you already, if you have a bunch of employees, the mail slots where you put everyone's mails that have a bunch of different uh, slots. Mm -hmm. I love those for creative people because you can put, if you're working on a project, you can put all your ideas into different slots and keep them clutter free and organized. But if you have a bit of paper, I'm not a fan of sticky notes, but if you wrote something on a sticky note, just keep all of that. And that's to manage it. Or you put all your magazines in a little area, or if they're journals that you read, depending on what you do. And so there are different things that you can do to help alleviate that. And I think you have to have some sense of freedom. I, you know, your employees kind of like your teenage kids, right? If you require too much, then they're going to rebel, but there are little things that you can do. And then you have to get them to understand what's my motivation. People trust me. I mean, they've done all, you can Google all sorts of surveys. People are trusted less that have messy desks, you know? And so this is how you're viewed. And if people understand that, or that I mentioned at the beginning, a roadblock to a promotion. So what, how do you define clutter? Cause this, I, I can, I'm processing this with a couple of folks <laughs> in our organization right now. My clutter is not your clutter. How do you define right. what clutter is? I'm very different. Clutter is anything that prevents you from creating the life you choose, deserve, and desire. It encompasses everything. You can have emotional clutter, spiritual clutter, clutter in your relationships, health. It's it's everything. It's what isn't important that you're allowing to impede your life. I think that's an interesting definition. So clutter is anything that prevents you from having the life that you want to say that again. Give me to, to choose, deserve, and desire. And I'm very deliberate on language. There's a different energy behind the word choose. That's proactive and strong where wants like kind of trying to pull to me where is your choose. Mm. So if I've chosen that this is the, the, the life, then I, it's not real for clutter, then I'm not going to really be uh, much on changing it. Well, no, what I mean by that is, I guess, what you're trying to create. And so it's more about that. And because the clutter is what's not important. We're allowing things that aren't important in our life to take over. Mm -hmm. So it's figuring out what's important to you, choosing that and understanding that you deserve it. You know, so many people think they're unworthy. They're not good enough. And that's not true. And so that's a big part of what I've seen when working with people to declutter. We understand the frustrations HOA board members and property managers face when deciding the best solution for their HOA and pool security. Should we use a keypad, hand out keys, or install a key card system? Do we even need cameras? These are some of the questions that are difficult to navigate, and we're here to help. At LockDock Security, we've spent over 20 years working with homeowners associations and property managers to find a system that best fits the pool and HOA needs. Camera systems for the front gate or front entrance, key card systems for the pool gates, or simply updating the gate so that it meets safety and code compliance. We like to take the guesswork out of the process to answer any questions and help find the right solution. Our mission is to help you protect your people and your property, and that includes pools. Contact our team today to schedule your free consultation for your community. Clutter is a real thing. It happens. I'm sure that if you're here, I, I, I'm just going to imagine that uh, I'm, I'm driving in my car right now, listening to this podcast episode, and I look around and I look down in my cup holder, my center console, and there's just a lot of different papers and receipts and whatever. Maybe uh, the the drink cup from yesterday uh, over in my door. This is not my car, by the way. I'm just imagining uh -huh. this in the other vehicles that I've been into. But the uh, over here in the in the left hand side, there's uh, all kind. You know, two uh, sunglass holders and maybe three pairs of sunglasses that I forgot about, and all kinds of other stuff. Like that may be the simple side. I've now become aware of it, 
So mm-hmm. now I'm aware. I'm like, oh, you know what? I Because I think we get into this situation, too, where we've all jumped into a car with somebody. And they go, oh, hold on just a second. And I got to clean yeah. out all this stuff out of the passenger seat and kind of straighten up real quick. Yep. So you're aware of it. But why is it not important normally? Like, why well, is that not an important factor? Sometimes people don't see it as a priority, right? And your car probably with everything going on is going to be at the bottom of the barrel. Mm-hmm. You know, your home would be more, people would be more motivated to do that. Now, if you have colleagues and do that, you'd hope that that would be more of a priority. But, you know, one thing I say to people like, I don't have time. How much do you spend on social media? I mean, the amount of time that people waste on social media is insane. And so, you have to commit to it, though. You have to write it down and schedule it. I don't know you people. Oh, I'll have it all up here. I can remember it. And I was like, no, write it down, you know, because if you don't write it down, it's not going to get done. So then you have to put it on your to do list. That one thing definitely helps. Not everyone, but a lot of people. But the clutter, you define it as clutter, but I see it as these are all of the things that I need. I might need this pair of sunglasses this day and this pair of sunglasses the other day, and I need to keep these receipts because I haven't done whatever I need to sure, do. Sure, then yet. you organize and you come up with systems for that. And you commit to, you know, I always recommend at the end of the week tidying up, if not at the end of the day, then you should be decluttering your car once a week. Okay, I, you know, I'm never going to miss a deduction. That's just me. I would be annoyed at myself. I pay my taxes. I want, you know, any write off. And so you should have a system set up for your receipts. And at the end of the week, you put the receipts there or you figure out, you know, different consoles or there are different things that you can buy, like something that goes on the back of a car and put your sunglasses there. But do you need three pairs of sunglasses i'm gonna argue probably not right and that's about discerning and but if they go with different outfits you might want to make sure that you know what absolutely you know seriously this is a good point to bring up you have to do but what i challenge you on if you have three pairs of sunglasses if you have you know five different things in the car it's you know it's more tends to happen the home if you collect everything Mm -hmm. if you have you know shoe for every day of the year if you Pick something or pick a couple things. You can't want to collect everything. Does that make sense? Can't collect everything, but you can collect some things. Yeah. I mean, because I'm not like, I'm not a minimalist. I have paintings up. I love things. I'm not about minimalism. But the challenge is we have all these groups and collections of things that we have. And, you know, so many times people think that's going to be worth money. Mm-hmm. And it's not like the kids today don't want the grandparent stuff. They think this Hummel thing's valuable. It's not. <laughs> okay, let's jump into this because this is this is real. So I, I think you know I'm trying to break this conversation into two separate areas. The, there's the there's the office and the work environment and the clutter. But now you're you've just kind of switched over on the home life clutter. And I think we I don't know about anybody else that's listening, but. Um, I'm kind of getting into this this time frame of life where mm-hmm. I'm having to I'm seeing and dealing with um, the situations where family members or family members that have passed on have left a lot of things. And uh, the conversation that I do think that has been consistent that I've had with a lot of folks is what you just said. This is very valuable. Don't let this go. Don't give this away. Don't throw that away. It's very valuable. And that turns into a just mass collection of Mm -hmm. stuff that nobody wants. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about cluttering, decluttering and talking about clutter, now we've moved into the home life, personal life and the things that you're holding on to that you don't actually need or use. So talk me through that because this is a real problem. This this is a real challenge that a lot of people have (laughs) is these are all my things and I don't want to let my things go because they're valuable or I need, I may need them one day. That's correct. Well, one of the places that people get stopped up is memories. Oh, you know, that was from our honeymoon or that's when we went to Hawaii with the family. And what you have to remember is our memories are on our head. Our memories in our heart. They're not in the object. The challenge is we transfer it in the object. And we think, Oh, if we let that object go, then the memory is going to go. No, it's not. The other thing, you know, this is goes back to discernment and being able to say, what is most important to me? Do I really need this? Do I really want this? People re- actually don't sit down and ask those questions. They don't want to dig deeper. They just want to kind of gloss over it. They don't want to take the time mm-hmm. to do it. You know, I hate those shows on TV 
because you have, I think, 48 minutes with the commercial on a 60 minute show and you don't see the hours and the days. You know, I just spent five weeks on a downsizing job Mm -hmm. with another person. So it takes time to do this. Yeah. So when you when you walk into those types of situations, obviously, you've got um, you've you've got the the individuals that have collected this and probably spent a lot of time. Maybe things have been passed on to them. They've they've collected them and now they feel like they need to hold on to them and pass them on to somebody else. So there's there's this value that's assumed, but also, like you said, the kind of emotional value that's associated with it. And then at the same point, it's the space, it's the the it's just it's just things that are either actually probably devaluing or or going bad just because they're sitting around. Correct. And the other thing you have to think about, if you especially if you're working with seniors, you know, you're at the tail end of your life. Mm-hmm. And so there can be a struggle there with what did my life mean? What was it worth? And you know, that some of that worth and identity is in the things. And so that can sometimes be a challenge. You know, I joke that we spend half our lives, the first half of our lives getting stuff. And then the second half of our lives ditching it. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it's just about sitting down, asking yourself the question and understanding that your worth is not in your possessions. It's not in your items, but then, you know, there's also family pressure. I know I worked with someone and her parent had been 20 years since her parents passed. And there are all these boxes in the basement. And I said to her, and she's like, well, I'm afraid that they're going to get upset. And what I say, and I truly believe, my mother, I was with my mother when she died last year. And I believe when people pass, they want you to be happy. Mm-hmm. Don't let that guilt make you keep something that you think, even though they've gone on, that they're going to get upset if you let it go. But, you know, you mentioned earlier that there are people, especially older people who think things have values and the younger generations are living a lot more lightly and just don't want them. And then, you know, as a good example, I just had a house clear out uh, yesterday and I'm excited because she offered five hundred dollars because I thought it was going to be a wash, meaning she has to take out the junk and do all that. And, you know, there's a fair amount of furniture and stuff. It just doesn't have the value that people think it does. Yeah. And and I, I think even more so on that, that from the next generation standpoint, um, we've we've gone through this and w- with uh, with family members of our own, we say, OK, here's something that's been passed down from the, the last five generations. And so we need to hold on to it again so that we can pass it down to, to our children. And so we're sitting there with our we've got a 14 year old daughter. I'm like do you want this thing? (laughs) And she's like, no. (laughs) I'm like, well, so do we, we're just, we just need to hold on to this so that whenever we pass that she can throw it away. Like, so we're just going to hold on to it for the next 40 years for no reason. Right. Oh, first of all, I can't believe you have a 14 year old daughter. You don't look old enough to have a 14 year old daughter. I appreciate that compliment. uh, You know, I think that's, I love that you had this conversation with her in all seriousness, because when I work with people, it's usually because something happened in childhood, like all the stuffed animals got thrown out and they weren't involved in the conversation. And so it was traumatic. So you understand Mm. why someone in their forties is holding on to stuffed animals and right. And you're not going to judge it because of that. So I think conversations are a great thing to have. And I always ask myself who can get better use of this. You know, there's so many people who, Maybe they're a victim of domestic violence or there was a house fire who have nothing Mm -hmm. that could truly benefit with those clothes that still have tags that are hanging in your closet. You know, it's can get you get in the frame of mind. I think this is good for people, but especially kids when they are challenged to let stuff go, take them to their favorite charity and then they can see, oh, you know, the blankets are going to benefit the animals because the animal can use it and and start getting early as possible to clear clutter and to be organized because that's also sets you up for success in life, in my humble opinion. So let's let's talk to the 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 40 year olds, the 50 year olds that have parents in their 60s, 70s, 80s um, that are kind of they're Maybe they're sitting in that, you know, either Mm -hmm. they're they're widowed or they're 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 still, you know, together and they're just kind of at the kind of last stages of their life. And they're sitting there in that 3000 square foot house with just the two Mm -hmm. of them and they can't really move around because there's so much stuff that they've collected over the past 60, 70 years of their life. 
How do you start having the conversation with those folks? Because um, from my experience, um, it has not really been received as well as let's get rid of your stuff <laughs> um, right. because it is taking something from me. So how do you start to approach that conversation? What are some of the best practices that you've seen um, that you've tried to apply as you've as you've navigated those things? Sure. Well, one of the things that many people that I work with in that situation are downsizing. So it's simply a question of, you know, all of this isn't going to fit. What do we want to take from there? So it might not be in the situation that you're talking about. So I would begin the conversation, you know, one, is there anything you want to give or is there anything you want to donate? And then, you know, you kind of have to have that dialogue. One of the challenges also, especially with older people, that a mistake that people make is they might want to tell a story about the Christmas ornament, right? When my mom was dying, she wanted to talk about every single ornament and the story behind it. And I understood that. So I was fine with that. And so, you know, maybe it's something from World War II or they served or whatever. And so I think that the earlier you can start this process, the better, but allowing them to tell the story is really important and not rushing through. And then sometimes you just need to bring in a professional to start those conversations. And, you know, they might have resistance to this, but, you know, again, how does it feel with all this stuff? Mm -hmm. You know, wouldn't you want to just lighten your load and feel better and let's give it to a good home. And it's kind of the same concept with talking about the charity. You have musical instruments you never knew. What about a band program where kids might be able to use it? And so trying to see, can we have someone else that would benefit from it more? Now, you know, there's some people that just aren't going to want to get rid of anything. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and the challenge comes with that after they die, because then it becomes a burden, mm -hmm. you know, and it's not so easy to say to a family member, hey, your stuff's going to be a burden to us. When you go, you know, it's not an easy conversation to have. Sometimes you can start it and then sometimes, you know, it's people aren't open or willing to listen to it. Now, I don't recommend this, but, you know, there are also things with elderly people like a pantry is a great example. A lot of times they seem to hold on to food that's mm. expired. So in those situations, I'm I believe in as much as possible, you involve the person. But sometimes when it's a challenge, you know, you take a garbage can and get out all the expired food when maybe they're in the room with someone else. So if there are things like that or that just that, you know, they aren't going to use or they haven't gotten to, like maybe they have a bunch of leftover paper that they're not going to use. I think it's OK to try to move that stuff out. But you have to it's a very delicate situation you definitely want don't want to take anything that's super important without involving them looking to make your conference stand out send your attendees home with more than just memories book our professional portrait booth today and get a fresh clean headshot for each attendee we handle all the heavy lifting from setup and tear down to post processing and final delivery it's honestly just that easy contact us today to add unique value to your conference so I, I, I'm, I was chuckling a little bit while you're having that conversation or while you were start talking about that, because I have had that conversation with my in-laws. I said, can you please get rid of all this stuff so I don't have to do it after you pass away? Because that's really going to be a pain. But the uh, it's it, it's met with laughter. But then I'm like, no, but seriously, it's going to take a lot of time to get rid of all this stuff. The um, I want I want to address this because I want as as you were talking through this and we mentioned this before we started recording about hoarders because hoarders are on a whole different level. And so you're talking about clutter versus hoarding. And we've, I'm sure many people have seen the, the television shows and the, the episodes where it's just, it's, it gets so out of control that people don't really can't care for themselves. And the house is really just kind of disintegrating inside. That's not what you're talking about. You're, you're talking about you kind of, I guess, help, help me with a definition or a description between the two. Well, with the hoarder, definitely like you can't move. I mean, there are like stuff you have maybe a pathway mm -hmm. to get from room to room. There is so much stuff. I'm talking about the average person who hasn't decluttered in 20, 30 or 40 years. And that's much more common than you think. How many people do you know that don't park their cars in the garage because the garages are stuffed? Uh oh, I think someone there might be someone that, you know, right. And that's typical. And you don't have to be super wealthy. You just never get rid of stuff. And so for when I mentioned the pantry items for someone, I wasn't talking about a hoarder in that situation. I'm talking something that I see with a lot of seniors. 
All right. Yeah. So I, I, I'm, I'm tracking with you on that. So you just mentioned something about they haven't decluttered in a while. I want to park there for just a second. In, in, because I, I want to, I want to try to think through some habits. And I know maybe we're bouncing this conversation back and forth, but it sounds like it'll be fun. In, um, and I want to, I want to talk personal, and then I want to talk business. In my yeah. household, obviously, I'm not to the age of, uh, of elderly folks or whatever, but. We oftentimes collect things. I've got two kids. Things come in, toys, this and that and the other, uh, shopping, shoes, all those types of things, right? How often, what are the, what are the best practices or, or habits that we need to start now that will obviously start to impact our children, our next generation? Because maybe I can't do a whole lot about uh, my parents or my in-laws or any of right. those types of things. How do I start changing the path for my children and their children with best practices of decluttering on a consistent basis? What does that look like? Great question. Well, first I'd recommend, like when people hire me, we do a purge. And if you're not going to hire someone, commit to purging everything you own annually. You go through every single item that you own. And if you do that, once you do the first time, it's a breeze after that. And you take the time, you block off the time on your calendar and you commit to doing it. And you say, do I really use this? Okay, it's been sitting in a box for a year. Can I let it go? Right. And you push yourself that's why a pro comes in handy because they can ask you questions like that. And then another big part of that is to stop it before it starts. Stop it before entering. I love leopard print, okay? But I'm not going to buy 20 different pairs of shoes in leopard print. So one thing I do, I'm very tactile. Ooh, I just want to touch that shoe. Isn't that pretty? And then I know, okay, I'm going to walk on. Mm-hmm. If I'm really, I'm like, oh, Cotty, I'm thinking of text. I'm thinking about these, talk me off the ledge. I'm thinking about these leopard print shoes. And she's like, Julie, how many do you have? Right. If you need that accountability, buddy, but you go through everything you own and you stop it before you start and you instill habits in your kids. So they understand what matters most, what is valuable and not to put everything like identity onto material possessions. You strike me as the type that's a little more practical, a little bit, a little bit more straightforward. But is this the process that you're talking about? Of does this bring me joy? I think she works. Marie Kondo works for some people. She doesn't work for everyone. I like for me that would be hard. I think we have a. a, a coat rack, you know, a little thing you put up and throw coats on. We have that in the basement. Does it bring me joy? Eh. But I put that we use it. I put all the winter <laughs> coats there. So I, that for me is is a challenge. And I there are things about her I love because I will say to people, give gratitude to something. Say like if you're getting rid of a memory, oh, Ice Kates, thank you for all the fun times. And I had such great memories with you and then let it go. Like I'm into that spiritual aspect. So I think that's really fantastic, but I don't think it's easy for everyone to say, does this bring me joy? I think that's, it doesn't, it doesn't work for everyone. It works for some people. Okay. So, but, but on the practical sense, is this something I'm practically using? And is there, is there like a time frame? say, man, I haven't used this in the past six months or past year or like how, what are the, some of the kind of rules and guidelines that you should be looking at? Cause if I'm going through everything that I own on an annual basis, how, what is like, ah, I don't like this anymore. Get rid of it. Or do I use, ask yourself questions. Do I use it? Do I need it? Do I want it? One of my favorite questions: does this represent who I am or who I want to be? So for instance, you're going to start your own business, but you got to f- closet full of corporate suits and you're not going to be a suit anymore. Let those corporate suits go. As far as guidelines, you know, one thing that traps people is, oh, I might need this someday. Right. And it's been there for 10 years and you've never used it. So then be willing to let it go. No. Can I rent it? Can I borrow it? You know, lots of places out there that you can rent. Can I try? What I say is, can I trust? I will get what I need when I need it. And that's challenging for people, but I always throw that out there. Can you trust that you'll get what you need when you need it? And some people are able to understand that and and do that. A year, but for clothes, maybe it's two years. I know like a lot, especially with women, weight fluctuates. So, but if it's been hanging in your closet for two years with tags still on it, maybe it's time to let it go. And then it's about digging deeper. Why am I afraid to let this go? Oh man, I just spent a hundred dollars on that mm-hmm. and it still has a tag on it. Okay. 
Well, lesson learned. Maybe we know that going forward that we really think through the purchase instead of because, oh, it's on sale and I have to get it, mm -hmm. right? And that's going back to being discerning and stopping it before it starts. Do I really need this blouse? Oh, you know what? I've got 20 blouses already. Uh, you know what? I'm going to stop or I'm going to at least take a breath and think about it overnight. And maybe that will prevent me because I don't really need it. Is that making sense? Sure. Yeah. The the impulse types of, of things that you just feel like you need to have. So I, one of the things I like about what you're saying is trying to apply some practical nature to the decision making versus, you know, I've, I've seen and watched and listened to the minimalist types of philosophies at times where it's like, you need to have three pairs of shoes and six shirts and four pairs of pants and this and that and the other. And to me, that's like, a bit of a box that I don't necessarily want to live in. Um, but I do like the process of looking at things going, you know what? I, I actually have not used this in a year. It's taking up space. What else could I be using that space for? Let's get rid of it. And if I need it again, then we can make that decision. Like you said, is this something that we need to rent? Is this a piece of equipment that we can rent instead of it sitting and taking up space in our facility the entire time? Or, you know, is this, suit. I wear this suit once every four years. I probably don't necessarily need to keep it because by the time I need to wear it again, it probably isn't going to fit. And I'm not a minimalist because I think that's true. And I think with me, when I, I associate minimalism as austere and just kind of not my style. And I, when I come home, I want to be able to relax. I want to have joy. I want to feel comfortable. I'm looking at my office. I've got a board with all these things that motivate me on my bookcase. I've got paintings on the wall. You know, I wouldn't, I want to be happy in my home. And if you, if you're minimalism and happy in your home, hats off, but it's not for everyone. And it's, you know, I talked about earlier, you know, and they said three pairs of shoes, if shoes are your thing, have at it and enjoy those. If those bring you joy and make you happy, but again, shoes are your things, computers are your things, books are your things. That's when it becomes so much. And I want people to think, how much time do you spend managing your possessions? <laughs> so you can have a, a few things, but don't have, not everything is your thing. Right, yeah, right. I, but there, but there, there are people who, who are, right? And then when you mix in that, keeping up with the Joneses, feeling like you have to get the latest, grade, I got to get a computer everywhere. Well, yeah. think about the cost of that and your time. You know, it, it, it's so much more than just the stuff. Simplify things. And I think um, I learned this lesson a couple of years ago when um, I, I switched vehicles and um, basically just got rid of everything. Uh, I went from a, a, from a, a truck to a car and I got rid of everything in the truck. A truck is a great clutter gatherer because it is the most practical vehicle. You can put things in the truck bed and like, and then it just stays there. And it's like, man, I've been carrying this tow strap around for the last five years and I haven't towed anybody. Um, mm -hmm. But it, it, and I, so I learned that lesson by getting rid of a bunch of things that I felt like I needed to have all the time for this, this kind of safety or, or whatever to more, navigating more of, Actually, all I need is my briefcase and my keys and my water bottle. Like that's pretty much the basics. And I can pretty much be content wherever uh, in whatever vehicle that I'm in. And it made it, it made a huge difference in mm -hmm. the cleanliness of my vehicle, the cleanliness of the area that I'm occupying because I'm not carrying so many possessions that I actually I found out I didn't actually need. And I bet it helped your mental clarity, too right? There was less stuff to worry about. And, you know, that affects everything. You're in, a, in, I would argue at a subconscious level, it probably was causing you stress that you weren't even aware about. So when you eliminated that, that helped reduce your stress. Well, I, 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 it did help with that. But the other big thing it did for me is it gave, it kind of boosted the confidence a little bit where I never was worried about my car being clean, never worried about having a guest come into my mm -hmm. vehicle, all those types of things, because it was, it was always clean and orderly and I don't have right. an issue with it. Like you literally could go out to my car right now and jump in and would be no issue because everything is clean and in order. Um, and it, this just been a process and a habit that I started and changed and maintained that I, I do need to carry that over to my desk. And I think after this conversation, I'm just going to go wipe everything off my desk because there's a lot of stuff on there. Cables, that you collect over time. Like, Hey, I'm going to need that to charge something at some point in time, but actually I don't really think I've ever charged anything with it. It's just yeah. been sitting there. 
Yeah. And I love that, that boost of confidence translated into your business, right? And I mentioned before, personal affects a professional, vice versa, inside, outside. So that supports you in being a better businessman. So with this purge in the personal side, and I'm trying to be intentional with our time here, but in the same purge on the business side as well, you can take segments of of your facility, your business, and start to mm-hmm. look at it on an annual basis and say, okay, do we use this? Is this something that we're... We, we actually did this study uh, here recently <coughs> in our inventory. We took the total cost for our facility uh, on a monthly basis and, or, or an annual basis and divided it down to the number of days and square footage and all mm-hmm. this sort of, and came up with this magical number um, that is basically per cost of square footage for mm-hmm. something to sit on uh, the shelf or to sit on the floor or whatever. And so you, I don't remember exactly what the calculation is, but we'll just make up something. Say it, it costs uh, $2 a day for something to sit in, on the floor. Mm-hmm. If I paid $300 for it at the course of a year, I have now that whole thing has been devalued. Right. Right. Um, and so it's something that we're, we're not perfect with, but I guess my question for you is how would you, how would you, uh, advise on starting to implement something like that in a business? Because, um, you know, I've been in facilities before that's like, wow, you know, there's 40 years of stuff in here and what are you supposed to do with it? Right. I think that's a great question. So filing is a good place to start. Now it's going to depend on, you know, like for instance, if you're in a medical office, I don't know what the guidelines, how long you have to retain records for that. So I would say, can you digitize anything like that? Just because files tend to take up a lot of space. Mm -hmm. And so that is something that I would recommend definitely to start off with, you know, also emails, a big thing purging emails, setting up a system to be able to respond to emails, because how much time I read a, a stat once that we spend eight hours a week dealing with email. That was just amazing to me. If you don't have a system set up to handle email efficiently. And I think what you did was oh, a cost analysis is something that is really important to do. So filing is definitely a place I'd start off with email, something that I would look at as well. And then if you don't have retention guideline, it's going to be very similar to to home. Why am I holding on to this? Can it be recycled? Can someone else get a benefit from it? What business, you know, feng shui talks about the energy of everything. I mentioned flower essences that I'm interested in. So if you have a bunch of clutter in your physical office space, you're preventing more business from coming in, right? Because if everything's energy and you just have this wall of clutter, you can't bring new energy. And especially if it's older things and you're changing the direction of your business, Mm -hmm. You're holding on to the past instead of being open to the future. Yeah, understood. I think those are some practical things. I've got uh, several notes here. Uh, Purge annually. uh, Ask, do I use it? Do I need it? Do I want it? Does this represent who I want to be? Does this represent who our business needs to be? Um, Can I trust that I need to get it when I, or that that I can get it when I need it? Um, understanding your filing regulations, digitize things, but basically create the routines. And and again, I think one of the big takeaways that it just kind of clicked with me through this conversation is obviously from a personal side, there's there's uh, generations ahead of you, but really start to set good habits now for generations mm-hmm. that are going to follow you because that's where you're going to get to see the biggest impact. You're sh- going to struggle most likely changing the habits and behaviors of those that are much older than you because they've been established yeah. in that. They've got that protection. <clears throat> so start to work on changing yourself or impacting yourself so that you can impact the next generation. Yeah. I, I think it definitely makes a huge difference. And I've mentioned a couple of times, everything's energy. So as you change around you, that can support people in changing as well and being open to change. Hey, Julie, thank you again for joining us today. Such a blast. Uh, man, learned a lot. A lot of notes here. Um, really excited to go clean off my desk. So I'm going to go do that right now and encourage you to do the same. Clean out your car, clean out your desk, keep your work area decluttered. It will give you a boost of confidence. It will give you a boost of clarity. And I think that uh, that sentiment is true. The clutter that you see around you is a representation of the clutter that you might have in your mind. So start with decluttering the physical space, and it will help to declutter your mind as well. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, We look forward to seeing you next time right here on the Coffee Break Podcast.